additional three music teachers at the time. We hired two. Coming into this school year, during the fall and winter, we then did a couple of other things. We created a music task force and created a vision. We came up with, with a vision. What did we want that money to lead to? What are the outcomes? We, we identified some outcomes that included one-year measures as well as up to three to five years. And that main piece of that, of that vision, if you will, was we wanted to restore music programs and arts too, but music programs is where we ended up talking to provide um, more music ready students for our secondary music programs at, at GW and TUSD. We also provided support and PD for our new elementary music and art teachers. Fast forward a little bit to uh, right now, and we recently created a K-6 music essential skills list. Basically, what are those essential skills in music that we want all kindergarten through sixth grade students to have um, as they matriculate through our music program? We created a marketing document. It's a trifold. The intent was to, wouldn't it be impressive to sit down with our music candidates and to show them the planning that our team has already done in terms of the program, right? And so that is something that we are, are very proud of that work. And now let's go out and hire more elementary music teachers. Here are the allocations for the current school year. Remember, it is, not to state the obvious, it is April, and uh, we had to commit to, uh, um, to staffing costs about this time last year. But these are the allocations for the current school year. So approximately 770,000 as a district, and to stay true to the requirements of Prop 28, 80 percent, uh, that second column, 80 percent has to go towards personnel, which the balance, 20 percent. Uh, it says materials allocation. It could be used really for anything other than personnel. Hey, Joe, when you say anything other than personnel, we're not going out of the parameters of the uh, program, correct? We're, we're not... We're staying within arts and musics, correct? Arts and music, and, and the, the, there is also um, language in there for coding as well, because that was actually was in the the ballot back when voters passed it in 2022. Right. So, so when we got our first chunk of money, one-time money, we used it outside because the parameters were out there, and that's allowed. What, I, what you're showing here is this money is intended use is for the program, correct? Correct. correct. That the money that you'll um, I'll take this one because there's just the, to be clear, um, the money that you were referencing, Mr. Perdue, was, is, a, is a different fund. I understand that. That was the art, music, and um, instructional materials grants, um, and that was allowed to be used on, on virtually anything. The um, AMS dollars or Prop 28 dollars is very specific to art, music, and coding. Um, so when Mr. Wen uh, says that 20% of the materials could be spent, that it could be spent on just about anything, he is referring to 20% as allowable as defined by Prop 28. Right. I understand that. So my other question before you go on, and thank you. Uh, we receive what I'm going to say is back pay. So when we when we got our check, that checks for the whole year, correct? And then we have to report. I think in May first is our first annual report. Will we spend all that equip? Will we do equipment? Will we spend that money before 
we do our reporting requirement to the state. Yes, that is the plan. That uh, we can't spend we can't spend it until there's a plan, uh, which the board uh, you have the detailed plans from each school site. Once that's approved, then we will take the next step and start spending that down. Let me kind of back up and talk a little bit about the waiver. Um, we did receive information about a waiver that, as a school district, we can write to to the state of California. If that waiver is approved, then for this year, that 80% towards personnel, uh, that requirement will be lifted so that for this initial year only, this initial year only, we could spend the entire allocation on anything related to arts, music, and so forth. So that waiver, um, as of before yesterday, we didn't even have access to submit the waiver yet, and, and my understanding that came through yesterday. Um, the details of that waiver was not communicated from the state to the school districts until, until this past March. So we're all in the same boat in terms of the districts, and I think I would expect a lot of school districts in California will be writing this waiver so that for this initial year, we don't have to follow the 80-20 uh, requirement. I, I understand that. I just, I've been on all the webinars over the past six months, um, and I, I know the waiver asks for an exemption from the Ed Code. Yeah. Um, and I'm not trying to tell you your business, but you hit the nail right on the head. There's probably going to be a thousand school districts trying to do it, so the sooner we ask for that, you know, uh, you know, we want to, we don't want to be tied up in that all that red tape and stuff. But r right, I'm I'm familiar with that. Yeah. And and thank you for moving forward on that because then we can really use some money, and not have to use it or lose it is what I call it. Correct. Correct. Right. Okay. And this last slide, just to share with the community a little bit, without going into all of the 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 proposed plans, it does present some of the common uh, proposed expenditures on our plans, all centered around greater access for students uh, during an instructional day and, and even extracurricular. Um, exam uh, some common strands, instrument lending library, that was brought up to be able to acquire more instruments to lend out when uh, a family cannot afford to rent or purchase their own hire more music arts teachers, pay for teacher hourly work. That could, that could be um, in, in preparation for in-class instruction or even extracurricular, professional development. We're committed here at Travis uh, to keep our teachers trained on the latest and greatest, and then instructional materials relating to the arts. And that's my last slide. Any questions? Just, uh, I have one more real mm -hmm. quick. So this has been a hot topic for almost a year now uh, with teachers following it, a lot of us following it, because it's, uh, it's just a great energy shot in the arm for this district, right? So with that said, um, I know that you have from May 1st to July 21st every year to do, your, to do the district's annual report that just kind of some where we're at, what we've done. My ask is, is in moving forward um, in the next couple of years, especially is the August meeting. Let's attach a copy of that to the agenda, not to take action on or anything, but so it's there for the board and everyone's viewing pleasure, so to say. Um, I, I, I would like to every year to look and see where you, you know what where we're moving what pathway um, okay I know a lot of the public won't but I as a board member I would but you, you know we can talk about all the expensive things and the million dollars all this stuff means a lot but this program means so much to the boots on the ground and the kids and I know from the principals why it just makes them for a healthy environment so with that said um, 
just keep doing what you're doing. <laughs> you know, uh, well, go ahead. Yeah, I'd just like to make a comment, uh, master the obvious here, but I'd just like to thank the public because Prop 28 is not one term or one year funds um, that we can actually hire against it, and it, it's a multi year fund. So, um, from a personnel perspective, from a staffing perspective, from a um, planning perspective, I'm just over the moon because I think this is awesome. Um, funds going straight to our kids for great programs that have unfortunately been axed under tight budgets. So super thankful for the voters. One, uh, one question. How many uh, music teachers do we have in total right now in the district? In district? Well, two in elementary. Uh, um, but there are, there are, and then there is uh, so one in, at GW and so four. four. And how much room do we have left to hire for? We are, we are shooting to hire, um, we want to have five at the elementary. Yeah. Okay. Well, we, also on the answer, um, correct me if I'm wrong, but the two that we have at the elementary now, they, they bounce around to different elementary sites, so we're not just, it's some are not left out at this time. We're, they're all getting a little piece of the pie right now, correct? Either music or arts, yes. Right, right, okay. Yeah. So we're looking to hire three more? Correct, correct. How long have we had the longest vacancy now for this? For music, I'm just curious. Do yeah, this year we had uh, one for this year that we were unable to hire a music teacher. Because keeping in mind, if we're talking just music, all districts are looking for music teachers right now. So if you uh, have you guys you have some music experience, get a credential. I'm you curious. Have, <laughs> yeah. have you guys seen a reduction in um, to teach music? Do you need a degree in music for? You need a credential. Oh. I, I, will, yeah. I won't answer here. Yeah, no, I'm here. We're here to tag team and, and <laughs> help out. So we currently um, have three vacancies. One vacancy has been open this school year, and we will have two additional vacancies for next year. Got it. And to teach music, do you need a you bachelor's need a in music or just a teaching credential? A teaching credential. Okay. So you might not have a bachelor's in music, it may be something else, but you need the credential in music. Okay. I was just curious if you guys had seen a reduction in music graduates at the college level uh, or not, but that doesn't maybe impact this. It, it probably, at, it's so new, it hasn't changed the, the college, the university level's graduate um, numbers. Um, I would hope that it would increase the number of graduates in those programs, but it's, it's a newer program, so I don't think we've seen that many students going into a program from the time that this was voted into law. Got it. And have you seen fairly uh, st stable credentialing or graduation at, for teaching at the university level? Have, has that remained uh, fairly consistent over the past couple of years, or has it gone down? Um, I wouldn't say it's gone down, but programs are reevaluating their, their programs. Davis has a smaller program graduating class this year than they have in some past years, so it really depends on the programs. And for music or for the whole school? For the, for, for the whole school. Okay. Thank you. Well, the school of, like, the teacher credentialing programs. Got it. Thank you. Sorry, uh, wait, you, you meant the credentialing program, which is at Davis, that went down? Yes. Okay. Yes. <laughs> Got it. Thank Not you. Not the music program. I don't know if I, I can't speak to that. <laughs> okay. Thank you. All right. Uh, Joe, correct me if I'm wrong. So in my journey following all of this, and there are some school districts that were gearing up and waiting for the money to show up as it did, but when you go to arts, there's, I, I know there's some districts that it's not the, your typical arts, it's more your construction type arts, uh, uh, woodworking, things like this. So when we think of arts, it's just not paintbrush and paint and drawings. You know, as the program gets bigger and expands and, and we get the interest, you know, there's a lot of other type of arts, too, uh, when it's time we can explore also. Yes. Okay, with that said, any, any other questions, comments? 
All right. Thank you. This is an action item. Do you have a motion and a second? So moved. Second. Student? Aye. All those in favor? Aye. 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 All those opposed? Motion passes. Thank you, Joe. We're good. going to move on to 10.2, Great Span Reconfiguration Facilities Update. This is information only, not an action item. Real Tiffany Benson. Real Tiffany. There we go. <laughs> the real okay. Tiffany Benson. <laughs> it's all, the mic's all yours, Tiffany. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and Gabe. The real <laughs> Tiffany and Gabe. Um, so if this were a TV show, this would be the part of the show where I did the recap from last time because we have been talking about this uh, all year. So very quickly, I do want to just remind everyone, especially the families at home, uh, what we've already done and what we've already discussed around this as the groundwork for our facilities conversation. So uh, again, at the beginning of our, our recap, I just want to remind you that we're really driven and grounded in this idea to continually reevaluate our programs and our facilities to make sure that they are meeting the changing needs of our students and that we are completely uh, aligned with all of our plans. So Mr. Badu, you mentioned our new strategic plan and our facilities master plan. And this, again, we're doing this at the same time so that we're maximizing our resources and being as efficient as possible um, as good stewards of the, the community's funds. So uh, with keeping that in mind, we have been reaching out to the community. And actually, if you add all of our student groups and our parent meetings, and our staff meetings, we've actually had 36 meetings outside of the board meetings to elicit feedback and gather some priorities. And again, you see those priority, priority lists here, um, not in priority order, but again, in considering a move of our sixth graders to Golden West, facilities expansion and improvement was very high in all of our, all of our community groups, be it faculty, families um, or students, especially students when they uh, are referring to activity spaces. Um, we also, again, some specialized things coming in there, wanting access to those electives, a, a community creation, um, having a hybrid approach to the program, uh, and again, some of the other high topics coming up. So with all of that in mind, and again, we so we now are Re we're reacquainted with what our community is looking for with a possibility of a move, we really want to consider what that move would mean, not just for GW, but what it would mean for our elementary schools. And I will say, you guys know me, I hate to be doom and gloom, um, but I think it's really important that we look at the implications of moving and also not moving. So we're gonna talk about both of those in this presentation so you guys know exactly what you're choosing between. So the first thing I wanna talk about, and this has also come up at a number of board meetings through be it discussions about bond, discussions about uh, classroom allocations, class size, it comes up in many ways, but what we are seeing is that our elementary school sites are facing increased pressure on their facilities. And if you look here at the, the reasons why, some of those um, we could see coming, um, and some of them um, are choices we've made to increase our services for our students. So uh, for things like increased TK enrollment, as you guys know, we're in the process of full implementation of TK, our transitional kindergarten. In the next two years, we'll be at full implementation and we'll be at the full um, regulation of class size uh, at 20 students per classroom. So when we get to full implementation in two years, we will need nine classrooms just for TK. And as you know, TK spaces are larger and have specific room requirements around them. We can't just put them in any classroom. Uh, also, we have a number of specialized services. Services I'm very proud that we provide here in the district, but they require specialized spaces. So that can be things like our intervention program, our English learning uh, language development program, speech, special education classes. Those classes, again, have a smaller 
class size, which is appropriate, but it means that we need more rooms to educate the same number of students. Uh, and we have seen over time that there, we have been providing an increase in special education services. So again, an increased facility pressure. Uh, in the last few years coming out of COVID, we've made a very conscious decision to increase our social emotional support and to continue to foster the great collaboration between our, our staff. Now for that, again, we need, we need some space for it. So we have dedicated wellness center spaces at all of our sites, um, but that does come at a cost of space. And we wanna continue to have staff meeting and collaboration space that is dedicated for our professionals. And that, again, is just another pressure that we have on our elementary facilities. So keeping those things in mind, and again, that, that's totally if enrollment stays flat. I'm just talking about what is going to happen in the next few years if we want to continue the programmatic support um, and meet the legal mandates for uh, programs like TK and special education. So with that in mind, I'm going to turn it over uh, to the money man who is going to tell you uh, what this would look like uh, at our facilities to continue this level of programmatic service. Thank you. Okay, so we have two options. First one is keeping our current configuration. So as you heard Tiffany just say, we have all these programs that we need to provide space for. <clears throat> you know, the new imp implementation of TK, you know, special education, all these things that are just gonna require us to expand facilities. So no matter which direction the district goes, whether it's, you know, moving sixth grade and putting in new classrooms over there, freeing up classroom space at the elementaries, or, um, adding classrooms at the elementary school sites to accommodate all those other programs, we're gonna have to put buildings down. That's just the way it is. We're really not gonna have much choice in that matter. Um, so first thing we can do is keep the current configuration and we could add classrooms out at the sites. Now, a couple of issues with that. One, it is considerably more expensive. It would probably have to be portable classroom buildings as sort of like what we saw at Cambridge at Foxborough this year. And really, as a district, we're trying to get away from that. Um, you know, as I spoke earlier about the science classrooms at Vanden, P building over at Golden West, their lifespan is shorter and they're just not, um, not built to last as long as we tend to keep them in service. So we really wanna to try to shy away from, uh, from using those. Big problem though, our sites don't actually have room to put any additional classrooms. So if we were to add any additional classrooms, we'd be taking up other spaces. We'd be taking up field space, playground space. Um, at center would be taking up space on their blacktop. So these are other spaces that schools need for a number of programs that we would actually have to take in order to, um, in order to add additional buildings down. Some of them are actually so short on space that we would probably have to install two-story classrooms, or uh, two-story portable classroom buildings. With that, I mean, you're, uh, you have to put elevators and all kinds of other accommodations in them, it is, expensive to do that and really not ideal. Um, you know, we at this point don't have a ton of extra land or space at those sites to be adding additional buildings. Um, so on the flip side, the other option we have is if there's a sixth grade move, then we would be adding facilities over there where there is space. Golden West actually, a, a lot of the block here, does have a good amount of space to expand, particularly with classrooms. As we're looking at Golden West and we're looking at the program and the number of students, um, we, we've kind of come up with a game plan. So it would add, <clears throat> excuse me, 15 new classrooms, uh, including two restrooms. Uh, new flex space, so it would be um, 
a bit larger than a classroom, but it could be used for any any number of things, special programs, um, you know, any type of, uh, you know, like club activities or anything that they want to use that additional space for, um, an additional workroom. And the best thing about it is we can actually, with this, we actually have the funding available to do it without being portable buildings. So these would not be portable. They would be um, what is commonly referred to as modular. And these pictures you see in front of you are examples of that exact product um, at other schools they've done uh, in the state. So basically how these work is it is, it is a slab with you know, walls built just as any other building, but the reason why these are so efficient is the walls are actually factory built. So they actually put the slab down, the walls are built in a factory, they truck it all over, and they put them up. They can put all, all of those 15 classrooms and all those other things up. Um, once the slab's down, it'll be up and enclosed in four days, five days maybe. So it cuts down construction cost, it cuts down construction time, which costs money, and um, and the end product really is the same thing as you know this structure or any other structure that is built um, you know on site from scratch. It's just done in a much more efficient manner because the walls themselves are built um, built in factory and trucked over. Um, an example of a building we have that's similar to that is the music building at Golden West. That is a similar type um, modular building. Um, so you can kind of see, like it, it looks just like any other building. Um, same type of quality, same lifespan as a normal building. We're not going to have the same issues we have with portables, particularly with siding, which seems to be a big problem with portables. We're constantly having to repair that and leaks. Um, so this, that's a, a great, um, great point. And as you can see, from an aesthetic standpoint, they look a lot better than portables. Lots of natural light, um, you know, just big open classrooms. Um, with that, though, we also understand that we can't just put down 15 classrooms, two restrooms, flex space, teacher workroom, and not address some other things. So with the sixth grade move, part of that project, uh, we could also fence in the entire school. So we are looking to pay for this entire project out of developer fees. With that, the nexus that we can use is, hey, you know, we, we're adding students to the campus, which makes supervision a little more difficult. So we're going to need fencing around the site, right, to accommodate that, to make that easier. So we can actually pay for that part out of uh, developer fees as well. And that would also get done quicker. So there's an upside to that. Um, additional security cameras would be added. Uh, we already have a good amount of cameras at that site right now. Um, but obviously, we would want to cover that whole area. And um, you know, and, and any thing that becomes a deficiency as a result of putting those new buildings down. So we'd have new cameras there. Um, and one thing that we actually found, and those two are both the fire PA and fire alarm systems are also on the um, uh, bond list. Those systems are old enough to where you can't really just add stuff. So uh, what we found with Cambridge and Foxborough is we actually just had to replace systems. So the fire alarm and PA systems would both be replaced at the same time. So the fence cameras and uh, PA alarm systems that would be part of bond would now be part of developer fee, which then frees up some bond money after that to be able to hopefully start getting into some of those tier two projects. So a lot of uh, benefits of, of going this direction. So this is sort of what the layout would look like. Uh, let me see, do I have a pointer on this thing? I do, but you can't see it on the screen, so it is worthless in that respect. OK. Uh, it actually. It's, it's not light enough against the screen, or it's not bright enough. So, OK. So if you don't mind, I'll, I'll kind of just stand closer just so I can demonstrate. Uh, or who's going to 
show you, show you where things are. So what you have here, um, this, this right here is uh, where the parking lot and the special ed uh, building will go. So that's right here. This is currently the student services building. The main DO building's right here. This right here is currently where that big mound of dirt is. So what we're doing is we're putting the classrooms on what is currently the blacktop because that's what that does is two things. Is that gives it, it its own little area over here close enough to the, the center of campus, to the uh, gym and everything here. It's a really good location. Um, as you can see, here's the easement for the water pipeline. So we're not touching that. Blacktop is, is fine. Obviously, this thing goes under roads and all kinds of stuff. So. Um, and under current blacktop, so that part's okay. So since we're taking up all of these, um, you know, basketball, tennis courts that were right here, we're going to take out that big mound and we're going to replace those here because PE uses those. So it's important to do that. Also, keeping in mind that we're going to have more staff, more staff. We need more parking. So we're gonna take this space here. We're gonna add staff parking to accommodate these classrooms here. Um, they'll be able to enter this way as well. So that way this all becomes very, um, uh, you know, it, very kind of fluid area in terms of being able to, you know, get staff in. Um, it's easy for, you know, students to come in uh, through here, access to the rest of the campus and access from the gym over to the new basketball and tennis areas. Um, after going through multiple different variations, this um, was the only one that did not end up in some really funky looking plan, basically to accommodate this 15 foot water pipe easement. So this is what we're looking at. Um, it's, uh, oh, here, I'll go back up to the podium. So, you know, as we're, you know, hearing from some of our feedback, um, you know, this, this gives us a couple of options. You know, if we wanted to have uh, a program that's a little more self-contained, perfectly fine. You know, we, we do have all those new classrooms in one area. If we want to integrate, it's also close enough to all the rest of the buildings that it's easy to do that as well. Um, so it's, it was a really well thought out kind of plan. Um, and it's also um, good in terms of security, where it's located. It's also located kind of, you know, towards the, um, towards the front of the school. So it's, um, yeah, I mean, it's, with, with this plan, it will definitely give them a very nice um, kind of refresh to the curb appeal of that site. So do you have any questions on any of that? Gabe, I got a couple. Sure. Uh, what's the significance of the green oval there? Um, that was just a thought of, you know, we could put something in there, some kind of landscaping okay. or grass or something. Thank you. We don't really know what we're going to do with it yet. And I'm not a professional educator. Um, one concern that I have, though, um, thank you, by the way, on all the work on this. I really do appreciate it, and I, I love the concept. Um, I'm a little alarmed um, at the proximity of the new classrooms, not only to the athletic area and fields, but also the close proximity to the road. Is, is that adequate in your mind uh, to prevent uh, both from a security perspective but also from a classroom distraction purpose? Do you, do, you, do you think that configuration is sustainable? Yeah, so we, so we went through that. It'll, the important thing, it'll be a fence that goes up um, right along that thing. So, right, so that's gonna provide a good amount of security from that fence. Um, we can also look at, um, you know, we're, we will put on any windows on that side. Um, what do they call it? It's like a, like a one-way blackout 
uh, sort of film on those so people can see out, but no one can see into them. And we'll also have additional window coverings on that side as well to make sure that um, you know no one can see in from the street. Um, so that'll be helpful. Um, in terms of noise from the courts, we're not terribly concerned about this. These buildings are very well insulated. So unless, um, I mean, unless they're, unless they're, you know, bouncing tennis balls off the windows, they're not really going to notice it. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Um, Tiffany, this might be more for you. So I'm okay with it with the education teacher part we we've heard from teachers we've heard from the teachers union um i i understand their support for this and and i'm on board with that so set the education part there's two things that really concern me here is number one is transportation we still don't have markley lane up and running out of the 400 plus students how many are going to ride the bus we have and it's not that we're doing anything wrong, but because of the situation the city of Fairfield's put us in, we have a hard time getting our students to school before the first bell as it is. It's intermittently, they're, they're late. It's not, we're doing the best we can. So with this impact, I would be looking in May 15th to see some kind of workup of what are we gonna do about transportation. That's my first concern. My second concern is this. We can have the fanciest buildings and the best teachers, which we do on and on and on, and a great experience there. But now we're taking sixth graders and we're bringing them to this environment. So extracurricular activities, and why it's so huge in my mind and what I've seen uh, on the ground is, it's not if they're the best player or the best this or the best that. It's when they get turned away and said, you can't participate it's an attitude thing, it's, it's a morale downer. So what I'm saying is, is you have band, you have robotics, you have all the different sports teams, okay? So you have coaches there and they wanna win. I, I mean, it's competition, right? They wanna win. What are we gonna do with all these sixth graders? Are we gearing up to have additional everything so sixth graders don't get turned around go home, they're sad, their grades go down. So those are, those are my two things I'm looking for, some good, some kind of start of a plan on the 15th, just to give you a heads up, okay. if that makes sense. Yes. I'm, Gabe, I, I see all this, and, and what I see, I, I'm okay with. Um, at the end of the day, everybody, we don't want kids back in hallways, we don't want, to take part of libraries for classrooms. We don't want to do any of that stuff anymore. That's way in our rear view mirror. So I think space is everything, you know. It's, it's again, this is just me. These kids are a product of their environment we put them in. So this I like. I, I, I thank you for all the time and everything um, in this. This I like. We, I think we just got to have a plan to get them there and make them feel comfortable so they want to pay attention in the classroom. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So I can speak to the transportation piece. So um, currently, the way it's set up, we have, um, you know, we, we first it's the elementary schools, and then here in the mornings, the elementary schools, then the high school, then the middle school last, right? So the way that the routes are run, obviously, I mean, we're transporting a lot of Bandon students, because Bandon's a lot larger of a school. So we have the same capacity when we're dropping Golden West. So we'll be able to handle all those additional students dropping them at Golden West. That's not gonna be an issue. Absolute, you know, worst case, you know, we, we add a, a bus and a route. I mean, yes, it's an ongoing cost, but it's not that much, particularly when we get reimbursed for 60% of our transportation costs. So we'll be able to make that work fairly easily. I'm not terribly concerned. The bigger thing more is scheduling, which has been the issue with making sure that they can get all the routes into each of the schools on time. This year has been a lot better than last. 
do still have a little bit of work to do, and we're going to continue to try to figure that out. But when it comes to scheduling, it's not just you know start and end times. There are all kinds of things in between we have to take into consideration. I know we have had, the three of us have had many, many, many long conversations trying to figure out how to squeeze everything into the day. So we're going to continue to work on it, but I really don't see that um, as much of an issue. Um, there may be a little added traffic because some parents are going to drop off their students. But even still, when you compare the number of cars that are coming in for Vanden as compared to Golden West, even adding more cars coming in Golden West, they don't come in at the same time. So it's still just, Golden West is not gonna be as bad as Vanden. Mm -hmm. So we're still not gonna get to that point where um, it is completely out of control. Right, but I think we need to take a hard look at, serious look at, is Peabody is congested now, mm -hmm. Uh, Vanden Road, there's no plans of any of this and all the new homes that are going up in uh, back of South Town, all in our district. So we're in, we're putting more cars, whether the cars or buses, you know, next year, the year after, the year after, we're, you still got to get from point A to point B. True. Um, so we, I mean, we have to kind of, and then they put that stop sign out there on Bandon Road. So that, so now our buses, you know, so yep. we, I think we have to have a plan so we can uh, counter whatever the city throws at us. We, we, I, I'm just, we need yes. to kind of think about and that. And that's, that's also part of the sequel process. So part of the sequel process is, um, you know, even, even if you go through for the exemption, you still need to look at the traffic. So we're still looking at the traffic. Um, now, because of the difference in times, because the you know van starts at eight thirty, they start after nine. Um, I mean, you, you have a time in between the two. You know, they're only going to have about sixty percent of the enrollment is Vanden, so it's not even going to get as crowded as Vanden drop off. So I'm not not terribly concerned about the traffic. Um, also, because of the odd timing, at nine something in the morning most traffic has gone through the area, right? And then it, when they get out at around three, it's still before you know, rush hour when it gets really busy. Vanden is really the, where it gets the worst. And I don't anticipate Golden West getting anywhere near that. The, on, the only other point that I would make um, to manage expectations regarding information still coming forth to the board in May um, is your, um, your, your comment, Mr. Badu, around um, us knowing how many people will be taking the bus. Um, I, I want to say that we will not have that information oh, in May. I understand that. Um, that if it is the decision of the board, that is an excellent um, component that will be examined next year for implementation, again, remember, is for 25-26. That's a, one example of the many things that we will be um, uh, surveying our families. So if my math is right, if the board approves this next month, it is the current fourth graders now that will be going to Golden West. That's correct. Okay. That's correct. Yeah. All right. Any, you know, just to, to we, touch on, you, you brought up, um, you know, extracurriculars and other things. Well, I'm oh, sorry, Ms. Oh. Millish, I'm so sorry. Ms. Byer has been trying to oh, ask sorry. her question. I'm totally sorry. So sorry. Yeah. It's That's okay. all right. <laughs> I was just wondering um, what the, what the community thoughts on this was from teachers and, um, you know, from hypothetically, um, if there was an elementary and a middle and a high school in this, which there obviously is, and those had different reputations, mm -hmm. and the one that we're talking about expanding might have the roughest reputation, mm -hmm. um, why would we expand and put more students in that when I feel like in some, in some, uh, parents opinions um, that's this is the school which they I think are kind of the most questionable on as far as safety and mm -hmm. and things like that yeah um, so there's many things I can say about that but probably 
the most transparent and best for you to make a decision is that in cases like this, we just ask the families. So it's true, there's perceptions of all of our schools, and the nice thing is when we're talking, whether we're surveying our families or whether we're having focus groups with the principals or whether we're meeting with our staff and then following up with surveys, they know exactly the schools I'm talking about. This is not a bond feasibility survey where they're talking about things in general. Everyone knows we're talking about moving the students from their current elementary schools to this middle school that we have right here. Um, and, and they have been polled and it's, they have been polled. It's all good. Yeah. It is. Yeah, I was okay, going to say, and it's overwhelmingly that's, in support. That's amazing. Then I just wanted to make sure. That's okay. I would say, though, there are things that we think will make this transition better in being really thoughtful in our community building, in our plan, and in the programmatic de development. Um, when we heard from the, the teachers last month, one of the strongest things I, in responses from the board was how they actually feel that by adding the sixth grade as a, a hybrid or a more sheltered model, that bringing all of the fifth graders together in a very thoughtful and strategic way, creating that community and then sending them into GW will really help with the overall community at the school. And that process of a six through eight school is supported by research around um, the best configuration for community at the middle level grades. Um, so we're very hopeful about it, not going in naive, but we're very hopeful about it. Okay. But, and to add one quick thing to but, that. Well, what, 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 wait a minute, real quick, Dave. Tiffany, I, I don't mean to, Tiffany, one thing that's out there in the community is, is there's a large group of the community that are okay with it and see it, but yes. their only hesitation is, is we got to do this right. Because if we don't, and, and that's our intention. I share that goal. I share it. <laughs> right. Yeah. So, and safety, security, number one. Absolutely. Go Absolutely. ahead, Gabe. I'm sorry. No. So, with that and, and building the community, we have to remember, we're not just moving one grade over at, the, at a time like we have in the past. We're actually moving two grades the same year, right? The, mm -hmm. fifth and, the fifth and sixth grades at those elementary schools will be going over the same time. So not only can we look at community building with point. just those fifth graders that'll be going over to sixth, but the fifth and sixth, and start that community building with both those grades at the same time, moving them over to Golden West. So that way, you know, as the as we continue that community building, um, you know, we'll have a larger group to start with to get that going. So it'll be um, that's it, a it gives us a little bit of an advantage. Mm -hmm as we're moving forward that particular year. Go, go ahead. Madam Vera, did you have something? Just to recap, uh, the plan is to build about 15 new classrooms. Yep. Uh, did you guys already do a, a projection on that uh, from cost perspective? Cost, yes, about 15 million for, uh, and that's for non-portable. So yeah. we can put portables down, it'll be a little more than half that cost. Um, but as I said, we want to go away from the portable building. I know I do. Uh, yeah. So how much? And, and we'll, we'll have the, we should have the ability to do that. How much money do we have right now in the developer fee uh, fund? We have a, a little over 12. Uh, we're bringing in between three and four a year. So projected by that time, we should have the 15 roughly that we're going to need to do it. Got it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I've got a follow-up on that now that we're talking costs. Um, so this is primary Gabe. Tiffany, great job. Thank you. Uh, well, I, I will say I key in on something Tiffany had mentioned. We had talked about potential programs uh, specifically as they relate to um, classroom requirements for yes. TK, special ed. Um, my question is, uh, let me start with the first one. So cost comparison, you just threw out a number associated with the Golden West consolidation. What was the estimated cost for um, the elementary school portable projects that you uh, re referenced earlier, and how do they how do they compare? Okay, so whether you go the portables or the other, add about fifteen to twenty percent, because you have additional cost because we have to have some two stories. You have additional cost because you have you know multiple sites that you have to mobilize everything as opposed to one site, um, and you also have the conditions out of the sites that make things a little more challenging than you do here at Golden West. So
So it's about a 15 to 20 percent increase. If you're doing individually at the elementaries. Okay, yeah. got it. Thank you. Um, with that in mind, um, I appreciate that. So that was step one. Step two goes to your question, uh, Tiffany, as it relates to, let's say, if, that's a big if, the board approves the consolidation of Golden West, we vacate the, the sixth grade classrooms at the various different elementary schools. Mm -hmm. um, do those existing classrooms meet those TK requirements and special ed requirements, or will the board kind of get bait, you know, bait and switched on hey, we're going to do the Golden West consolidation, all is great, and then get levied a secondary bill to bring up those classrooms to meet educational code requirements for TK and for special ed. So, um, so some of them will have to be updated. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, but what this, hopefully, if we, uh, we have one that goes through, a lot of that stuff will be part of the, uh, you know, so you're seeing the uh, project list and the bonds of, stuff and the restroom renovations, all that. So it'll be included as part of that. That would <coughs> buy us a little bit of time because we'd still have a couple of years before we would need that much space. So we'd be able to do that as part of that kind of natural modernization okay. process through the bond project and then um, and then have, you know, obviously the stuff over here at Golden West. Um, it makes sense in the long run to do it that way. Now, if in the event bond doesn't happen at that point, um, you know, because it's, it's growth in students and growth in programs, uh, we're still able to use developer fees by that point, which you have enough um, to go in. And, you know, there, while generally modernization you can't use developer fees for, you can if you are, if you needed to expand a particular program. So like in this case, like you know, we need more TK classrooms. The cost of, of um, getting classrooms ready to house a TK class would be okay. Okay. So what I'm hearing, though, is it's a sunk cost regardless. Regardless if we do the Golden West oh, yeah. consolidation or we create those facilities at the existing locations. My hope was you were going to tell me that by doing the Golden West project, we were going to create adequate spaces for those programs and save that cost later but regardless we're going to have some. to pay that cost it, it, some, some of it it depends time. yeah okay. and, it, and it does the, also depend on the site that's so right some sites um, that may actually not need any some right. that you know probably will need a little bit um, but it's not going to be near the scope that we would need if we had to uh, if we if we were you know moving so, so it's a bit it, of a distraction but i include recommending those costs um, savings um, as part of the greater Golden West discussion um, for future savings as it relates to future investment requirements. That, that too can, will likely be a consideration well after the initial decision um, because the um, actual number of classrooms, TK classrooms that will have to be added um, is enrollment dependent. So we won't know that until the full implementation is in place. Um, also keep in mind, we also have the option um, of moving students um, uh, that not all TK students necessarily attend their school of residence. So it may be um, a cost-saving measure that we um, funnel the TK students to the schools that do have sure. enough classrooms so that it is not an added cost. Okay. No, I appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah. Just as a, a side note, I I totally agree with my uh, colleague, Manveer. I can't, then portables are just way, those were back in the 60s and 70s. But also a side note is, is I don't think the community around our schools, when I, um, out there, uh, when I talk about Cambridge and Foxborough, I don't think, and we need our community and our neighbors, I don't think they'd want to look at double-decker portables stacked on top of each other. I mean, I'm a homeowner, and I don't want to look at that. So I, I, I'm just saying that that's kind of a plus for this, too, um, moving forward. But, uh, yeah, I, I don't like the idea of portables, and I, I thank you for bringing this. I think, uh, 
I think the think tank did very well on this. I, I really like it. Okay, board members, any other questions? W one question, are we looking to decide between these two plans right now? No. Next meeting. Got it. But for, uh, for information on the 15th of May, it'll be on the agenda as a yes or no item, so we'll have to decide. And is that when we're deciding if sixth so grade's move, move it or, or not. not. Yeah. So one thing to uh, staff, um, thank you for this being on the agenda today, because if we didn't have this and we had to do all this on the 15th, we wouldn't leave here to the 16th. So that was a good right. call too. I appreciate that. Uh, Tiffany and Gabe, thank you, as always. Okay, moving forward, number 11, approval of resolution to excuse trustee buyer's attendance at the March 19th, 2024 regular governing board meeting. Pam, that's you. It is an action item. That is just, a, you is, just need a motion. That's simple. Okay. Thank you. So do I have a motion so to moved. accept the resolution? Second. All of, oh, student? Aye. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion passes. Okay, we're going to move into number 12, communication, three-minute um, reports for some. Uh, Nadine, Mark, you guys, whoever wants to go first or second, you're welcome to. Me, because the Warriors are on, and I think they're losing. Uh-oh. Yeah, bummer. Good evening. I just wanted to share, as you know, I'm the president of CSEA, and I wanted to share that this year was the first year that the district sponsored two of our members to attend the CSEA paraeducator training, which was held down south in Ontario. And the individuals that attended provided us positive feedback and they said they got a lot out of it and that they wished that they wished that other paraeducators could also have that training as well. And we look um, back up. It had good things like interactive trainings and strategies for working with students with special needs. Um, they thought that every para should have the opportunity and we're hopeful that the district, the district will continue to sponsor the paras, um, maybe even more, uh, especially secondary because they don't get the supplemental training that we give in house here. The other thing I wanted to talk about is May is CSEW. It has CSEW week. CSEW is for the classified school employee week, which is usually held in May, May 19th through the 25th this year. And typically the district combines teacher appreciation week with CSEW, but we were just hoping that this year that we could be acknowledged separately because you know classified is usually working behind the scenes and it would be nice to be recognized independently and separately to celebrate the classified members on their own. And that's about it. Go Warriors. <laughs> uh, Pam, with, with Nadine's comment um, later this week, can we talk about recognizing separately, doing something? I know it's the windows outside of our board meeting. Yeah. Um, we can Uh, Mark? Good evening again. You'll be interviewing superintendent candidates soon. Your candidates will be saying, hire me, although I've never worked in your school district. I have no prior interest in your community, and I have no knowledge of your deep underlying problems. I want you to hire me to work with people I've never met, including $260,000 to $300,000 a year. The local hire is efficient and purpose of fast. Brett Farley, superintendent of the California Monastery Project, was hired by Nixon. Farley earned a bachelor's degree from Florida College of Journalism and Communications and a law degree from the University of San Diego. His undergraduate degree is not even credential, credentialable. He has no teaching experience. Jennifer Sachs, the new superintendent of Fairfield, is now embroiled in a terrible controversy. She was an instructional aide, a classroom teacher, Title I coordinator, a curriculum in instruction and chief of educational services, only one of her seven jobs was teacher. 
Did these two really want to work with kids? Did they give the, count the countless volunteer hours of touring, building relationships with parents, preparing, enriching, and engaging lessons, leading clubs, being a class advisor, coaching, or were they just there for a larger paycheck? We have good people in our district, proven records of success and dedication, people we trust, people we like. I hope you've read the letter supporting Rashida Turner as the next principal at center. She's perfect for the job. She's the highest quality candidate. And of course, we endorse Bill Sardi as superintendent. Now, all of you were uh, in the military. You should have received some training in game theory and been introduced to the prisoner's dilemma. The winning strategy over hundreds of thousands of simulations was tit for tat. Simply cooperate until your opponent defects. When your opponent defects, retaliate. When they cooperate, return to cooperation. Successful qualities, be nice, forgiving, retaliatory, and clear. So clear. Trust has been broken in the district. Last year, we bargained for 86% of COLA in true up language. We were asked to cooperate, and we did. $600,000 were left off the table. One month later, a new management salary schedule was proposed with significant increases and ratified. Of course, we were not told this in bargaining. The district defected. Our next move should be to retaliate, but that is never good for students. Simply, what we want is we want a superintendent we can trust in bargaining, one that is transparent, one that will cooperate, and one that will support teachers. And additionally, one we can count on to help develop a plan to, de to deal with our most challenging students, like I mentioned earlier tonight. And I guess I still have time. Thank you, Mark. Thanks. Moving on, student board member report. Um, good evening, board members and community. Um, last week at Vanden, as you guys have probably heard in the ATM report, about um, all of these slides uh, said something about um, Purple Up and military child um, support. Um, so that's what we did last week. Miss Post and our JROTC set up lunchtime activities all throughout the week, which was really nice. And on Wednesday, we dressed up um, in purple to show our support. Um, this week is pretty much our most eventful week. We have Spirit Week. Um, and so we have lunch skits in the Little Theater. Um, little theater, it is little, so unfortunately, um, some of our students haven't been able, or probably towards the senior and junior skits, they might not be able to see the skits as they haven't been able to in the past years because of the size of the theater, um, but that's just a little, a little thing. Um, <laughs> and then, uh, from my last report, we have been receiving, um, only positive feedback I've been hearing from the security dogs, from our students. Um, I've heard from Ms. Shields that they've been on our campus around 10 times. I've only seen them twice, so um, they're just hidden in there enough, whereas the students can come find them if they want to, so that's nice. Um, and we are looking to open a new club at our school. Um, it's the SAVE Club, SAVE Club. It stands for Students Against Violence Everywhere. Um, it's part of the Sandy Hooks Promise. Um, so we have our club advisors and we are going to start promoting it to our student body for next year's uh, new chartered club. Board Member Menver. So on May 13th, the, uh, the local CSBA chapter for the School Board Association will have their general meeting, and then looking forward to attending the Educator of the Year Award. I think a few of us went last year, so looking forward to that again in a couple of weeks. Uh, I think that wraps up my, my report. Thank you, School Board Member Mindy. No report. Vice President? Yeah, I'll just uh, echo uh, Purple Up. Uh, it's hard, it's not as nice as yours, Matt, but you know, <laughs> representing uh, just want to obviously, you know, keep the entire district in mind, but this month take the opportunity to really appreciate what our military children um, go through in order to support their um, parent that is uh, in, serving in the military. Uh, it did warm my heart also to see the eclipse and the schools taking advantage of that natural opportunity. You know, as an employee of NASA, I too was out there with my gla glasses 
watching the eclipse and um, uh, it just really made me happy to see the schools take advantage of those opportunities. And um, I I'll just say, while it's not on the agenda, I too concur that I think field trips are an important part of our education uh, at large uh, because it gives the kids an opportunity to get out of the classroom and do something different. And I know, I personally remember all the field trips that I had the opportunity to go on. So I appreciate those comments and look for those opportunities to expand um, our educational opportunities. Um, I had the pleasure of attending the National Honor Society induction this week. Um, and I thought it was a very class act and I was really happy to see uh, Vannon put that and I think it was the first uh, NHS induction that the district has done and and I applaud um, everybody that was involved with that and I uh, just want to say thank you uh, and last but not least I just want to give it a yet another shout out to uh, the teachers to the um, classified staff unclassified staff um, but also the staff in general for all the hard work that it takes not only to do right by our students not to, only to do right by our staff, um, but to continue to make uh, and continue the legacy of making Travis Unified the district of choice. Uh, a lot of the discussions went on today, took a tremendous amount of work, tremendous amount of staff capacity, um, and I see it improving the district, not just today, but in the future. And I just wanna let you all know how much it's appreciated. So thank you. Thank you, Will. <coughs> I just have a couple things. First, I'd like to talk about field trips. Um, I get a lot, a lot of emails, which is fine. I love them. Uh, good thing for an old retired guy like me to sit down and read. However, field trips has been the hot topic and a little on social media, but people express their true feelings. Um, it's like I stated, you know, when it, it, it's hard because the PTAs work hard. Golden West doesn't even currently have a PTA. And it's hard on the PTA members, but also it's hard on the families because to execute a lot of these things, we always have to have our hand out. And it's more money, more money, more money, more money. So we took a little look at, and, and I talked to the superintendent, and we're going to meet later this week. We have a new transportation um, gentleman. I, I met him. Um, I like him. I think he's got some good ideas. Um, but at the end of the day, we need to come up with a plan so our hand isn't out for money. Our kids can go on educational field trips. Now, if, if we're going to Disneyland or we're going to the, to the park in Vallejo to go down water slides and stuff, yeah, we might have to put our hand out. But it's, to me, it's part of growing it's part of the kids, uh, part of their school. They only, they're only third graders, fourth graders, fifth graders, sixth graders once. It needs to be part of that. Um, I can speak to Cambridge uh, early, late 90s. I can speak to Foxborough where Tyler went for six years. You know, it was science camp. It was field trips. Um, science camp naturally was a couple days, but the, all the kids got out of their classrooms and, and did, it's just a part of growing up and coming to school. So we're gonna work on a plan and hopefully um, the, the district will have some good instructions coming back in August and we'll be able to facilitate these. So I'm, I'm very hopeful that we'll get to the bottom of it. Um, Yes, Fairfield Sassoon, they contract with a private provider, but that contract is really large for field trips, just everything, all their extracurricular, all their athletics, because um, that's been talked about a lot. Um, is that off the table? No, but we're working on it. So everyone out there listening, all moms and dads, um, we're almost graduation time, summertime. Um, we'll, we'll have some sort of a plan. Can't tell you what it is, but it's it's up on it's up on the top of my list. Um, I'm glad you mentioned about the the dog abandoned. A lot of parents, and I mean a lot of parents, I haven't heard one negative thing. So then, when I was up there last week, um, I had two kids, 
and I can't tell you their names. I just know them. Hi, goodbye. You know, there's so many kids there. And if, it's, if they have their way, they're going to adopt that dog as their mascot. So will we ever know how much that dog deterred? No. But from what I see, it's working. Um, I don't know if you agree with me or not, but I, uh, I don't think we've had any encounters but friendly encounters. So that, uh, that's a good feeling because that was a, that was a tough one if we, if we did it or we didn't. Um, and I got to tell you, Will, and I'll quit talking to everybody in a minute, you're the one that up that, stepped it up a little, that what I brought to the table, and I think it's paying off. I, I, I really do. I think it was a good call that you made and the rest of the board, and I stand behind it. Uh, just one other thing, a lot of stuff. I'm not going to repeat what the vice president said. A lot of work um, uh, from classified to certificated. You know, if you drive down here on any given night when school's been over and the teachers are released, you see a handful of cars there, and it's all about there's no overtime or anything being paid. We do all the old school things to help our students from prom closets to the, 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 if we had to pay the teachers for everything that we did, we wouldn't even be here. We'd be broke. So... I'm just kind of mirroring off what the vice president said. Thank you and keep it up. Um, I think we're traveling down a really good road here. Okay, with that said, um, as I always say, um, the most important thing to continue on from here is everyone drive home safely. Um, look forward to the meeting. We have several meetings. Um, technically, Pam, on the 15th, after we approve the new superintendent, we're, we should have um, two people sitting at this uh, sitting at this table. So, uh, big meeting on the fifteenth. Um, you got a lot of time to still hit up board members and put in input. Everybody, please go home safe.